You might have seen every episode of Bonanza, experienced the woes of dysentery in Oregon Trail, and devoured all the top Louis L'Amour novels. But do you truly understand what life was like in the Old West? If you've done all that, you're probably more knowledgeable about the West than the average American, and that's commendable. However, many aspects of life on the Western frontier didn't make it into popular culture, and they've been replaced by inaccurate myths or nearly forgotten entirely. Here are 10 intriguing facts about life in the Wild West that often get overlooked in history movies and books. Swinging saloon doors were real, not just Hollywood. In every Western movie, you've seen those swinging saloon doors. They're a classic. You might think they're just a Hollywood invention, but these Batwing-style doors were actually used in the Old West for real. Here's why. Saloons back then were pretty small, more like the size of a kid's room than a master bedroom. They didn't have air conditioning or good ventilation, so they got hot and smoky fast. The Batwing-style doors offered a bit of privacy while letting in fresh air and getting rid of the smelly, smoky air from inside. They were also open enough to let the sounds of music and laughter drift outside. Saloon owners hoped that would tempt people passing by to come in. Because the Old West had its fair share of crime, saloons had a smart setup, swinging doors during business hours, and solid floor-to-ceiling doors with strong locks to keep the whiskey safe when the place was closed. Speaking of whiskey, it was terrible. If you sidled up to the bar in the Old West expecting a smooth glass of Kentucky whiskey, you'd be in for a nasty surprise. The stuff they called whiskey back then was often a mix of actual whiskey, creek water, molasses, base spirits, grain alcohol, cider vinegar, fruit juice, axle grease, and who knows what else. No wonder Old West whiskey had colorful nicknames like Tangle Leg, Coffin Varnish, Chain Lightning, Cactus Poison, Mountain Howitzer, and more. There weren't many rules about what could go into alcoholic drinks back then, and even if there were, people probably wouldn't have followed them. It wasn't until 1897 that the Bottle and Bond Act guaranteed the quality of whiskey contents, and the Food and Drug Act of 1906 put more regulations on whiskey and other drinks. A bit boring, right? Forget dysentery. But don't drink the water fans of the 1980s computer game. Oregon Trail might say that most pioneers in the Old West died from dysentery or snake bite, but that's not true. The main cause of death for people in the Old West wasn't dysentery, snake bites, gunfights, or attacks by Native Americans. It was actually cholera. Cholera is caused by bacteria in water, especially in stagnant water like ponds, puddles, and slow creeks. Pioneers in the Old West didn't have fancy water filters like today's hardcore hikers. When they got thirsty, they drank water from the nearest source. Unfortunately, many of them drank up the cholera bacteria along with the water. This led to severe diarrhea, vomiting, and stomach cramps. Within a few hours to a couple of days, the person would often die, mostly from dehydration. The only treatment available at the time was an opium-based painkiller that didn't really cure the illness. The Old West had an opioid issue. Think opioid abuse is a modern problem? Think again. Chinese laborers who came to California during the gold rush and worked on the Transcontinental Railroad brought their opium smoking habit with them. For the first time, opium, which had long been used in medicine, was used for recreation. The Chinese immigrants introduced the opium pipe to the Americans they worked with. Starting around 1870, opium use became widespread in the Old West. It wasn't just gamblers and prostitutes who enjoyed the opium pipe. Regular farmers, ranchers, and even their wives used it. Here's an interesting twist. Many of the estimated 250,000 opium addicts in the late 1890s actually supported the temperance movement. They declared that alcohol was so harmful it should be banned, but opium, well, they didn't see it as a problem. The West was full of price gouging. When gold was found in California, it triggered a huge rush of people heading West in hopes of striking it rich. But they soon realized that the ones truly getting rich during the gold rush were the merchants who took advantage of the situation and the absence of government regulation. The prices of goods sold in gold rush camps were unbelievably high making today's inflation troubles seem trivial. For example, a dozen eggs in 1851 cost about $1.3, which is similar to the price today. However, when you adjust that 1851 price to today's equivalent, a dozen eggs would be $1.105. Merchants also charge $20 for a pound of butter, more than $700 today. That is one expensive-ass breakfast. 
Breakfast on the trail was hard work speaking of breakfast. For pioneers heading west, it was a whole different story compared to what people have today. It definitely wasn't about grabbing Starbucks and a bagel. Traveling in a wagon train meant waking up around 4 in the morning to get breakfast ready, break down the camp, get the horses ready, and gather the cattle. Coffee and bacon were the go-to foods. The women, insert eye roll about traditional gender roles here, would get the fire going so they could roast green coffee beans in a skillet. After roasting, they'd grind the beans and brew coffee with water over an open fire. And here I am, complaining that my Keurig takes too long. They'd also fry up slabs of bacon. On a good day, they might have some cornmeal gruel too. Bacon wasn't just a morning treat. It was such a staple that pioneers ate it two or three times a day. Well-smoked and cured bacon could, theoretically, last the whole journey. Although I have my doubts. Frontier folks used buffalo dung for cooking fuel. You know what the Great Plains didn't have? Trees. You know what they had a lot of? Buffalo poop. Because trees were scarce on the Great Plains, people had to get creative with how they fueled their campfires. That's where dried buffalo dung came in. Seriously. As gross and unappealing as it may sound, it got the job done. When burned, the dried buffalo dung, often called meadow pies, produced a quick, hot, and surprisingly odorless fire. Perfect for cooking that bacon. These prairie chips, another catchy name, were easy to find and pick up. The trick was to look for dung that had dried out in the hot sun, not the fresh, steamy stuff. The Army's War on Buffalo In the 1830s, the United States Army declared a war on buffalo. They hired people to head west and kill as many buffalo as possible, and they encouraged settlers in the west to do the same. Why did they do this? Well, it wasn't because the buffalo had done anything wrong. It was mainly because buffalo were a major food source for Native Americans. White Americans, in a not-so-great move, wanted to remove Native Americans from their ancestral lands and take over those lands for themselves. Since the Native Americans didn't agree with this plan, the government decided to target their most valuable resource, the buffalo. At the start of the 1800s, there were estimated to be between 10 and 30 million buffalo. But by 1889, only 256 buffalo remained, and they were in captivity. The West had strict gun control laws. Despite what Hollywood movies show, most Old West towns had very strict gun laws. Even the famous ones like Deadwood, Dodge City, and Tombstone. Carrying a gun within the city limits of these towns, and many others, was illegal. People entering town had to stop at the sheriff's office and leave their guns there before settling in. It was like a coat check, except America doesn't have a coat control problem. Go figure. Loose requirements for sheriffs. In the Old West, the position of sheriff was an elected one, and not a very appealing job. The pay was often minimal, or it might be a percentage of the fines imposed on people or taxes collected from locals. This system seemed like an invitation for corruption. Each state or territory had its own requirements for sheriffs, and they had nothing to do with experience, education, or background checks. In most places, being 21 or older and a U.S. citizen were the only requirements. And nobody really checked that last part. Some states had no requirements at all. For instance, in Texas, the 1876 Texas Constitution only mentioned that sheriffs served two-year terms. It didn't specify age, citizenship, gender, race, or previous criminal record. That's how Moses Burton, an African-American, became sheriff of Fort Bend County in 1869, a year before the 15th Amendment granted African-Americans the right to vote. Burton was the country's first black sheriff. Remember to hit that subscribe button and like the video if you're loving the content. Your support means the world to us.